We are here at the ORNL Molten Salt Reactor Workshop 2018. I'm Thomas Jan Peterson. I'm from Copenhagen Atomics, one of the molten salt reactor startup companies. Around 250 people in total interested in molten salt reactors. Um, and we all hope that we can move this field forward. I'm having visa issues, so maybe you guys could talk right where you were. I don't think it'll go badly, but um, if you guys are having... Is it the same, the tourist visa yeah. thing? Or? Yeah. Yeah, so it, we have the same problem. Just do exactly what you're doing, but... <laughs> they run for? Well, they'll just keep going. But when you're done, turn them off, okay? It's just to explain, Why so... Why do you have to go to Knoxville? There's a side office. I don't know. I got, a, I got a stamp in my passport saying business visa. And he got a stamp saying tourist visa. And we didn't oh. care to ask, we didn't know. You know they just yeah. stamped it, right? It's this loop, it's oh, on a pallet, cool. so you can move it around. Yeah. And it basically in here, you just have a tank down here with the salt, and mm -hmm. then the pump, and then you can just pump it around. And then you can add uh, different uh, tests on that. You can even take the pipes out. We want to take the pipes out inside a, a glove box and come back. Okay. We haven't done that yet, but... Is it uh, for uh, just heat transfer or... It's for... Corrosion? Yeah, for testing pumps and valves and measurement equipment. We have a LIPS measurement system where you can use a laser-induced breakdown spectros spectroscopy uh, yeah, <laughs> to, uh, to measure the different isotopes in the salt while it's pumping around. Oh, okay. And we need to... You know that, that we want to make that into a commercial product that oh. other people can use for reactors Good. and we can use it ourselves as well uh, but in order to get that to a level where it's a commercial product we need to do lots of testing on molten salt while it's circulating so that's part of the reason why we built the loop would that be fluoride and chloride yeah so we can make measurements every second for example mm -hmm. so it helps you a lot if while you're running the reactor every second you get a like a profile of all the different isotopes you have in the reactor and you can see how that changes over time so you can you can detect if there's played out or corrosion or or some other components are wearing down are you also looking at being able to uh, look at uh, thorium fuel cycle yeah definitely we are a big big fan of the thorium fuel cycle Good. so we think that the thorium fuel cycle creates a lot less waste and it is able to scale to a large amount of energy output yeah well that's uh, that's going to be my pitch at the uh, <laughs> Belgian meeting. I'm not allowed to talk about thorium here. Okay. Ah, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> because Lou Lou said, don't go off on one of your rants. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> the the whole point of uh, your your team back then was to okay, let's build it with uranium first, make sure it works, and then let's run it with uh, thorium later. Oh, yeah. But then you never got to run it. That's yeah. really really sad. Yeah, it is. I'm sorry, can I move you? Uh, we need to go back a little bit further. Mostly trying to widen up, so you're both. Okay, continue. That's perfect. Uh -huh. I actually, if the. Oh, well, just, yeah. uh, is that okay? Yeah, you can ask questions. Yeah, I have a question. Could you talk a little about, like, what was the atmosphere of innovation back then? Like, how, like, when you were working on them, sorry, like, what was the, like, innovation cycle, like, troubleshooting? Like, what was the approach to engineering? The whole sorry. Oh. Approach to engineering. Well, you know, we we were uh, much more limited with the uh, technology, the equipment that we were given to do analysis, and uh, it's been quite a change in the last 60 years. Today, uh, in the in the light water reactor industry, if you want to change something, uh, oftentimes they say it's going to take 10 years to change it. Oh. But we have a clear understanding from all the different reactor designs that were back in the 60s and 50s that the the cycle time between you found out that you wanted to change something till you actually change it was more like a month not years uh, oh. and definitely not decades in the case of the MSRE if yeah. we wanted to change something we'd write up a, a little let's do this and it would go up the line not too far mm -hmm. I mean uh, Dick Engel and Paul Hobbenrich maybe and they'd sign off on it and we'd do it yeah it's not, uh, it, it was very different back yeah. then. That's, that's also kind of what we get from the videos from back then when we see videos about how things were built. Um, yeah. and, uh, yeah. and I think some of the things we do today are put too much uh, constraints on what people can do. So the yeah. progress is too slow. But of course we also have to, we also have to be responsible and safe. And some other isotopes have horrible gammas. Yeah. The maintenance could be a real problem, except that we've got robotics now. Yeah. And as long as the robotics are uh, hardened 
so that they can stand the gamma. That's that's something that uh, that can help solve the problem. Yes. So I'm 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 pretty I'm pretty sure that uh, um, there's enough new technology and things like that that can solve these extra problems you're going to get into with the thorium That's a great question. Hey, you're a yacht. How do you know this is your yacht? I just put microphones on your yacht. Oh, the guy with the short pants? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what anyone looks like. You're the only guy yeah. here. Join in. <laughs> Join in the video. Okay. Did you get your uh, Knoxville thing settled? Some no, no, I have to go away. Just keep doing what you guys are doing. It's great. Yeah, just continue. Go. Okay. Like, yeah, I can't, I can't you're, uh, if you can explain uh, your role in the whole thing in the 60s. Let me ask you the question first. Yes. Did you work on the design of the MSRE? Yes. Uh -huh. Okay, then you have been longer on my consult than I have been. Well, yeah. I started out in Germany in 1963 and we were a guy from here by the name of Paul Kasten came over and led the Institute of Reactor Development in Germany in Jülich and bought the molten salt and at that time the idea was you had to have a breeder yes. so we went to an epithermal molten salt reactor which is a better can be a better breeder and that was how I got involved. The name of the reactor was Molten Mosel, after the Mosel River, but ah. it's Molten Salt Epithermal. Oh, yeah. And we were always very proud of the name of it. Yeah. And then it was discontinued, the program. I heard you mentioning that you worked on HTGRs. I worked on HTGRs on the, uh, what they call the Kartoffelhaufen reactor potato heap reactor yes. because it was made out of spheres of graphite yes. and then I came to the United States and first was five years in Kentucky at the f faculty on University of Kentucky and then I came down here. Hmm. I didn't know you were from Kentucky. Your I'm a Kentucky. Your I'm a hillbilly from Kentucky. Yeah, okay. <laughs> the Molson reactor Mosul experiment in Germany, was it ever turned You speak on? German? Uh, not on video, but I, I, I understand German fairly well, but if I, I need to be in Germany for one week before I can start speaking any. What's your accent? I'm from Denmark. The Molson reactor in, uh, in Germany, was it ever turned on or? No, it wasn't. It wasn't even built. It was not built, just this design. Not work. even got in, it didn't come even close to the stage of building. If I remember correctly, there was some pebble bed reactor. Uh, there on. was a pe there yeah, are two pebble bed reactors. Yeah. One is the AVR, which was built while I was in Germany. It went critical while I was there. And my office was a, across the street from, from the reactor. It's a German word, about <laughs> that long. <laughs> <laughs> Atomversuchsreaktor. Experimental reactor. Yes, yes. And then there was a THTR, the power reactor. Say again? How old do you two know each other? Oh, we, we've worked together for what, 50 years? I met him when he, when he first came in uh, on the uh, gas cool reactor project. Uh, and uh, I, was on, I was on it then when he came in. So did you guys both know Richard then? Uh, Richard Engel? Oh, yeah. yeah I, well, Dick didn't work on the gas reactor as far as yeah. I know. So the gas reactor is after the molten salt reactor. Oh, yeah. So you guys met after the molten salt reactor. Yeah. We worked on the gas cooled fast reactor, GCFR that was at that time again a breeder reactor competing with the LMFBR and the CRBR was being built at that time until they discontinued it and he helped with everything everything I know with, I know from Sid because he did the calculations whenever I needed I didn't do much with the GCFR the fast reactor I thought that was a an accident waiting to happen and I, yeah. I just didn't like accidents. One, one of the nice things I like about these advanced reactors, that both the molten salt and the uh, modular HTGR gas cooled, is that they don't have accidents. They don't have really bad accidents. That, that's, people that's always ask me, what is, the worst, what is the worst thing that can happen? Uh, maybe you guys can explain like, what, what is your like, worst case scenario with a molten salt reactor? Uh, 
like if somebody shoots a missile at it or uh, you know what even that wouldn't be it's that, that terrible no it would not be like fukushima it is the opposite no. of other reactors you have to understand it's a liquid fuel yes and if it if it burst what is a meltdown in other reactors it freezes because it's it's running at a high temperature and when it goes off it becomes subcritical it freezes and all you need is theoretically three things a pot a pipe and a pump <laughs> but some somebody who worked with me added in a force p a, a pen to collect that what leaks out and freezes sure. down there and all you need is to put a new vessel and pump it back in and you run it again one of the major problems i think would be uh, if uh, the stuff started freezing in the in the pipes yeah piping system but it's not an accident it's just then then yeah, maybe if you cannot heat it up again in the pipe then you have real, to a real pain in the ass yeah. to get it going again yeah that's true yeah. but it's not an accident uh, I, n I never did the any thorough investigation of that but i wouldn't think it would be that much of a safety problem no. because it is such a self-negative reactivity with temperature there's a cold plug accident if you put in you start a pump from a source where the salt is cold and you pump it into the reactor you get a reactivity jump that can be one that you have to deal with but it's not as serious as with Maybe other reactors. if you do that and you get a, a rupture of a vessel or something and you spill out the salt then that's of course you basically broke your reactor but again, you don't get radioactive elements into the environment and the neighborhood. We simulated uh, a lot of those uh, cold slug accidents, and uh, it didn't didn't amount to any real safety problem. Yeah. Now I don't know if we simulated the absolute worst worst case because mm -hmm. you, you can dream up things that are pretty much non-physical. Mm -hmm. that, that was one of the things that caused me to worry about any of these things getting through our licensing because uh, when I, uh, I worked on the HTGR a lot yes. with, the, with the NRC, they would always dream up uh, something else because they couldn't find any reasonable thing to make it a safety problem. Yes. And uh, so rather than having them say, oh great, this is a safe reactor, we can get the licensing going, they, they just, had trouble wrapping around that. Hmm. And once we got these guys ready to, oh yeah, I think I understand, they moved to another division and they got new guys coming in, ah, <laughs> okay. starting over again. When I was working with my Japanese buddies, I said, how come you guys get an experiment going? They, they had some really nice experiments going. The HTTR was a good guess goal. I don't think, I don't think they ever got a molten salt thing going, but they would they would work on that and fund it and have all sorts of great experiments and things and i said how can you keep that thing going and he, they said well you know we don't have coal supplies or other options we need the power and so we've got to work on this stuff so yeah that that hasn't been our problem but now we've got uh, the global warming thing fluid fuel reactors are fundamentally different from solid fuel reactors and that's what Sid explained, educating the, the license people who have to give you the license is a terrible work. You have to start from scratch and to go through the entire development. And that's what's the problem and they don't last long enough. Global warming is going to uh, do really bad things like cause uh, populations to have to move. Yeah. Millions of people. We need to bring uh, a better way of living to people wherever they are. Mm -hmm. and, and one way of beta bringing a better way of living is energy. I mean, energy is one of the fundamental things Ab that absolutely. needs to be there. Absolutely. Energy and water. Yeah. Okay, I worked on the nuclear desalination program for a while. Yes. And uh, that was a neat, a neat program. And uh, we worked uh, with the idea of trying to get the Middle East people to work jointly on getting more. They're, they're, well, Yuri's from Israel and he, he knows what Yeah, that's like. water is also important. <laughs> Why not having the idea enough water? To, 
bring reactors to Sinai and make it a refugee s peninsula. The reactors will bring energy and desalination and it will be a blooming place for, for all kinds of... and there was very little population. Yes, it's easy to take the discussion that we all think that climate change is a problem and we should solve that and we should all use less energy. But when you start to ask people, nobody wants to use less energy. Population in the world is growing really fast. I think it's 80 million people every year. So it's the entire population of Germany we add to the global population every year. So even if you didn't have the increase in world population, you'd have the uh, underclass people, the mm. people who are in third world countries, getting more and more developed and their demand for energy goes up. I think the only thing that can make me useless if it was more expensive because if I it's not only me I mean if I look at all the the other people I know in in society nobody wants to be useless how are you going to push that politically in the United well, States yeah that's uh, yeah it's very impossible that's basically why we are doing this molten salt reactor thing it's because we have a strong belief that this is one of the ways we can create twice as much energy in the world and that will help solve some of those problems oh, yeah. but I'm also a little bit afraid that if we create a lot more additional energy maybe people will start to have three kits instead of two and then we ha didn't solve anything. Well I, th I think it tends to go the other way the more affluent people get the l fewer kids they have. Oh. Late night television is a great uh, <laughs> way of cutting down on the <laughs> Most people in the bad shape right now don't have the flexibility and the resources you do to solve a problem for you. I mean, you don't, you don't have a problem. That's really? true. I have enough free resources that I can work on this. Sure. And it would make a lot of sense yeah. if we can make it work. I don't have enough money to build a full reactor. I would need support from other people, but I can take some of the first steps. You need the reactors to solve the CO2 problem. Without solving the CO2 problem, you don't solve the climate change problem. Without solving the climate change problem, you don't solve any problem. Mm. The, the kinds of things that can happen are, are, can be catastrophic. Uh, they call them tipping points. Yes. You're familiar with the tipping yes. points. Yeah, like if it gets really bad like that, huge dislocations in populations can, you know, cause, that can create cause, wars. cause yeah. a war. Yeah, yeah. sure. This crazy country that you're in right now uh, decided to increase the military budget by, it was either 60 billion or 80 billion over the last two years, I, depending on which you read. Yeah, okay. Give me 1% of that, we can build in <laughs> molten salt reactors. That's exactly my point. A real aggressive uh, molten salt thorium cycle, you could solve these problems and get something running fast. Yeah. Now. If, if you look at the, the things that a, a well-developed thorium cycle machine could do, you can take care of the, uh, the global warming thing. Uh, it, it's, this takes a while. <laughs> yeah, of course, but... <laughs> but and, and, and you could um, uh, get people to be more relaxed about their resources. You know, we, don't, we wouldn't have to invade uh, Iraq. Yeah, fight over yeah. oil and gas. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Reduce the chances of war and have sensible people in charge, you cut back on all that expense, put it into energy development, clean energy development. Mm -hmm. After our, our meltdown in 2007, 2008, the, a year after that, uh, Goldman Sachs gave their workers total uh, oh, working, $16 billion. Yeah. Dollars. Yes. In 16, bonus, yeah. yeah. Okay. $16 billion, if a third of that were put into solving problems. Yeah. I mean, you know, money, they, they say, oh, these reactors are too expensive. Well, they don't account for the external costs, like pollution mm -hmm. uh, or wars, etc., cetera, or, um, or global warming. Yeah. So, you know, so we've talked to a number of investors and my feeling that, that there's enough money out there. The problem is not money, the problem is risk because the investor sees if they put money into something, 
there's somebody else who can make a decision that it won't happen. Like you will not be allowed to turn on the reactor. You can build the whole thing, yeah. but you will not be allowed to turn it on. And somebody else has the power to, to make that happen. So then the investor is not about the afraid of their technology. He's afraid of uh, what other people might do to stop the progress. I got involved uh, with the Green Party. Uh, a good friend of mine was a, a, a character in the US Green Party. And uh, so I got arguing with some of their top drawer type guys. And <coughs> they're going on the LNT, the linear no threshold mm -hmm. idea that one guy said, for every milliram that you nuclear guy produces, you're killing a baby. What? <laughs> yeah. If you multiply the very low probability by millions of people, hmm which is what LNT does, yeah. you're killing babies. No. But did you tell him about uh, radioactivity in coal ash or in bananas or I, 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 I tried everything. Yeah. I mean, the simplest thing that seems to work with some people is the people in Denver who get 400 milligram per year instead of 200. Yeah. Uh, they they should be dying they like they flies. They <laughs> well, they should at least have a noticeable increase. They don't, no. okay? And the, there are some medical studies that were done recently that, that um, follow the, the actual process that happens when you get low doses. Mm. If you get low doses and time to, it, it tends to re repair itself. Mm. The Fukushima accident, for example, some people were saying, oh, uh, because of the radiation, um, so many thousands of people are gonna die from it. Well. The, the doses that were gotten by everybody, including the guys that went into the plant to try to turn the valves, open the valves, they didn't get enough to affect their, their cancer uh, probabilities. The reason I wanted to get the, the Green Party involved is if we could get them on board and say uh, nuclear is green, that, that'd be a heck, that of a good, a lot, yeah. a good, heck of a good thing. Hmm. Especially in a place like Germany, where the Green Party is essential to their coalition. You, you may know about that. They're, they're about 6% or something. And uh, the, the group in power needs them as part of their coalition. <laughs> uh, if you could convince these guys about this LNT thing, you could, you could well, Germany, you know, they, they've gone ape shit about the uh, shutting down their, their I reactors. They're still shutting down their reactors, yeah. unfortunately. Yeah, but don't you think maybe uh, at, at some point it will, it will reverse? Like in Japan, they also, after Fukushima... Convinced it will reverse. Yeah. The only question is when, when yeah. and how much damage will have been done by then. Yeah. Yeah, you know, how much of these last hurricanes is due to the climate change and how much the severity. Hmm. And you can't prove some of these things, and so you, those extreme other gu and other guys can always claim that it's not related. We would really like to build a lot of these molten salt reactors and put them everywhere in the world where people are, so they can get a better life. Mm -hmm. So um, let's say we build a number of these already, and it, it turns out to work well. What? How do you feel about putting? one of these in, an, in some Africa country where maybe there's not a super stable government. Um, do you feel it's a, that would be an awful thing to do or do you think it can be managed? If there's, if there's an, uh, like when we have war zones, there's UN troops uh, with these blue helmets up as a, observers. You know, maybe we could have similar thing. You, you could allow people in an unstable region of the world put a reactor there, but have international inspectors come there and make sure that everything is going on okay. Do you think that would be safe or do you think uh, this would be unsafe to put nuclear reactors in countries like that? Depends a whole lot on the local situation and, and how much they could pretty much guarantee that they wouldn't try to blow it up. Mm. But even if they blow it up, we kind of agree that there's we won't kill any people. Of course, the, the cost of that one will be lost. Dick Engel had a re reactor that I called the sealed reactor yeah. in which he would send a, a complete reactor to any place including those that are problematic yeah. and <coughs> it'll be sealed for 20 years and after 20 years somebody will come in and ch change. Yeah. 
Yeah, take it back. There's also concepts of very safe molten salt reactors that you cannot divert enough fuel from them without being knowing knowing about it. Yes. But it's always a problem and and just the idea that it can happen is uh, is one that has to be mm. dealt with. But molten salt reactors are I dare say the safest reactors there are. Mm. You could conceive of a, of a reactor that barely works that is safer but well, w when you get involved with the politics, though, it's it's hard to say. I mean, even if somebody blew it up and it didn't contaminate the rest of the place, it would be huge news. And, oh, reactor, radiation, blah, blah, scheduled to go to Japan to help them with their, their reactor. And I had the, all the work figured out and I was almost getting on the plane and that uh, criticality accident in uh, uh, Nara happened. Uh, I think two or three people were killed. They canceled my trip. Yeah. But uh, they, they had people sheltering in place a uh, 20 minute train ride from, from that place, which, you know, the exposed area was a few hundred meters. <clears throat> and it got all over the world. Japan's worst nuclear accident, uh, and three people died the same week. There was a, a spill in uh, of a hydro dam in in Africa that th killed 300 people, yeah. and that didn't make the newspaper. Even if you convince 90 percent of the people that that this LNT is a bunch of crap, mm. uh, the news about nuclear problems would would be terrible. But salt reactors have another advantage, they can burn the fuel that's used for bombs yeah. in a very safe way yes. and get to totally rid of it and in a useful way because it'll produce energy while it does it. Yeah. Yeah, well, there are very few other concepts that can do that. Yeah. Well, the storage of spent fuel is so much easier with the molten salt, especially with the uh, as I understand it, the chloride is even better than the fluoride. I don't, I don't it's a little bit easier to, to convert the spent nuclear fuel rods into chloride salts and get it uh, going in a fast reactor. But, uh, but I, from my experience, I think we can also do that for, uh, into fluorides and use it in, in thermal yeah. spectrum okay. reactors. Okay, uh, but but there's, there's rumors that because of some decisions in the 70s here in the U.S. that the U.S. will not allow us to do reprocessing of spent nuclear fuel anywhere in the world. I, I don't know if that's just rumors or if it's really true and I think this is some of the things we need to test. I talked to people from Canada on Monday and they said, oh, but we, you can likely be allowed to do this here in Canada. Mm -hmm. So, you know, once you start to do it in some countries, Canada can do it, Russia can do it, China can do it. Uh, I don't know who else can do it, but once you start to be doing the, the thing there, then hopefully also here in the US it'll happen and in several of the other European countries. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but we need to get started on that, too, because most peop most politicians don't know. They think the waste problem from nuclear reactors cannot be solved. They don't know that you can burn it again and, and make it a lot less waste. Or you could just store it in a safe place. It's not much. It's very little. Yeah, but, you know, they see it as a big problem. And, and uh, yes. in my country, we don't even have spent fuel. We have just uh, waste from, from uh, like... Uh, medical uh, hospitals and stuff uh, and low level radioactive and they are discussing like crazy where, th where to put that a and I'm like the coal ash has also radioactivity but the yeah. population doesn't know that so they don't debate it they just yeah. put it in the r right in the middle of Copenhagen uh, oh really oh we've had some really bad coal spills how did you get involved in that molten salt Okay, my background is in software engineering and mathematical modeling, uh -huh. um, and I've done a lot of uh, uh, technology-related uh, uh, startups and basically worked with new technology my whole life. Uh, and then I was, I've been interested in energy production for many years for some of the reasons we discussed earlier. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, 
I started to hear about this Thor Amenity. I've never heard about it before. Yeah. And the first couple of times I read about it on the internet, I was like, ah, it can't be true. It's got, mm -hmm. you know, it's got to be one of these. Was it Kirk Sorensen's? Uh, I think s one of the first stories one was not but by Kirk. It was like uh -huh. a, a news article somewhere. But maybe that one was inspired by Kirk. I don't know. Yeah. But eventually I got around to see some of Kirk's videos and yeah. his TED talk really early on. And, and it was right, right, uh, round, right around the time when I saw some of those first videos, I thought, I got to figure out what's wrong here. I mean, I got to figure, they're, they're, I'm sure there wasn't some error they just hadn't told me about. So I started researching, you know, what is the error? Oh. <laughs> now it's lunch. <laughs>